Welcome back, everyone. What a great day one of Slack Frontiers it's been. With over 18 breakout sessions, five solid hours of demos, and hundreds of messages being sent in our Slack Frontiers workspace. But there's still more to come. We have a very special keynote up next. It'll start with our next chapter panel, where the podcasters from Ear Hustle will be talking about stories of resiliency and success from San Quentin. And then a very special treat, comedian and author Sarah Cooper is joining us for a humorous monologue, and then she'll be sitting down with me for a fireside chat to talk about the future of work. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to our CEO, Stuart Butterfield. In the early days when Slack was just starting to take off, I had some friendly pressure from some of our partners, companies like Atlassian and Salesforce, who had uh, started something called Pledge 1%. And the idea was that organizations could pledge 1% of their equity, 1% of employee time, 1% of their profit, 1% uh, of their product to uh, charitable and philanthropic purposes. So we decided to do that. And uh, we did 1% of our equity and 1% of employee time. And that obviously uh, worked out pretty well. And we gave employees a lot of latitude for volunteer opportunities that made sense to them for um, parts of the world where they thought that they had a unique ability to derive change or a unique desire. And uh, in 2015, I went to, to San Quentin to uh, visit an organization called The Last Mile. And that visit was, was pretty transformative for me. And, and as you'll see in a second, pretty transformative for what we ended up calling Slack for Good. Because to me, criminal justice reform uh, is one of the most important issues facing the country. And one of the biggest opportunities we have, I think, to become a better and more moral society. That line um, that you can judge the quality of a culture by how it treats its poorest and most vulnerable is something that I believe in. So during that visit to San Quentin, I met one of the panelists you're about to hear from, Ali Tambora. And I was struck by his intelligence and his dedication um, to re-entering the workflow as, a, as an engineer. And this was you know, uh, in an environment where people didn't have access to the internet. Many people had been incarcerated for so long that they had never used the internet. They had never used Facebook. They'd never seen an app. And here they were learning to develop apps on the internet. And it was, it was a pretty remarkable um, group. And, and since then, hundreds of Slack employees have gone out to visit. And the visit also, I think, was really instrumental with us coming up with the next chapter as one of Slack for Good's projects. And we launched that in 2018, and uh, the first three apprentices that entered the program are now full-time engineers at Slack. And uh, this year, the program expanded. Um, partners like Zoom and Dropbox joined us, and um, we're expecting a lot more um, over the next little while. So we're still hiring into this program, and. Uh, the results so far have been pretty magical, but it's not a magic bullet. It's small but meaningful step forward, addressing the long-term systemic changes that are needed to make companies, our country, more just and more inclusive. And I should say, we're not the experts, and it's crucial for us to hear from those directly impacted by the criminal justice system and involved in the daily work to create change. So as we talk about workplace transformation against the backdrop of a world where incarcerated individuals are not only struggling to re-enter society, but struggling to maintain their health while in prison, this conversation is incredibly important. So stay tuned to learn more and hear from Next Chapter's director of re-entry, Kenyatta Liao. I love basketball, I love photography. San Francisco is new to me, so I just like going to the top of a hill in the city and like taking pictures of the landscape. I went to Slack for my interview. It blew my mind. I never thought in my life I'd ever walk into some place like that. You can read about the criminal justice issue. You can have ideas of what the people are who are incarcerated. When you meet the individuals who are working so hard to change their life, you can't do nothing. Next chapter is a partnership between Slack Technologies, The Last Mile, Free America, and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. We recognize the potential that this work had to really transform how the tech sector goes about providing opportunity to individuals with criminal records. People re-entering society after leaving an incarcerated setting are up against tremendous odds. Talent and ability are everywhere, but opportunity is not. I went in as a kid, and um, I came out as like a grown man. They gave me two licenses. Honestly, I never thought I was going to be home. 
We got our candidates from The Last Mile, which is an organization that teaches incarcerated individuals how to code. They went to a coding boot camp, and they went through our regular interview process. We have provided a framework for change that starts in prison with The Last Mile, a support system that starts there and carries over to the outside. Coming into SLAG, it was intimidating. I knew that the interviews were gonna be hard, but honestly, like, I went in there and I just spoke from my heart. He will stay up till 4 a.m. to get a project done two days early. Not even to get it on time, but to get it done early. I struggle a lot with like imposter syndrome. My highest level of education is a GD. If I didn't have the apprenticeship with Slack, I mean, I would still be back home. It would have been super tough. Jesse not getting a job at Slack or another tech company would be an absolute waste of talent and the absolute waste of a good human's ability to make the world better. And this was an experiment, and the experiment worked. But if we want to see impact that bends the curve for the whole country or the whole world, part of that is enlisting others to join in. My family is super happy. And every time I talk to them, they're always telling me how proud they are of me. It feels good to know that their smile they have on their face is because of me. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the entire Next Chapter team, I want to thank you for making time to join us today for what I believe is a very timely conversation. And my name is Kenyatta Leal, and as Stuart mentioned, I'm the reentry director for Next Chapter, which is an eight month apprenticeship program. Uh, it's actually a paid apprenticeship program designed to help formerly incarcerated folks you know, succeed in tech. And really on a larger scale, we're trying to just create a more equitable workplace for people who are leaving incarcerated settings a place where everyone can actually thrive. And so I'm really excited to have this panel today. Um, we're gonna to be joined by three very, very special guests. All three of these guests I met while I was serving time at San Quentin. All three of these people have made tremendous change in their lives and I believe are just really, really valuable um, examples of what change looks like and what um, the power of support and opportunity can do in someone's life. And so, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ali Tambora from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and Mr. Erlon Woods and Mrs. Nigel Poor from the podcast Ear Hustle. So thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to dive into it right away. And Ali, first question's for you. We first met at San Quentin. And when I first yeah. met you, man, I mean, I knew that you were gonna be successful. Your drive, your determination, the things that you were doing there on the yard really demonstrated to me you know, that you were thinking beyond the walls, you know, and you were trying to you know, take your life to the next level. And for me, I mean, I think just, that's just really important thing for folks to know about. So um, if you could just take a moment to, to share with us a little bit about, you know, what was your North Star when you were inside and what kept you on this trajectory to where you're to get to where you're at right now? That's, that's a good question. I just I don't think that I'm any different than any other person that's that's incarcerated. Everybody has uh, dreams of coming home and thriving, and um, and those same dreams are are what drove me or keeps keeps me driving in my work today. You know, I wanted to be able to stand on my own feet. I wanted to be able to take care of myself. I wanted to be able to take care of my family. Um, and I know if I continue to work hard, um, it'll always pay dividends. Um, and I also want to inspire people who, who have gone through the justice system, like myself and, and others, and know that like, if we put in the work, um, we will be successful. And obviously, there's all kinds of collateral consequences that um, stand in our way. Um, those barriers are, are barriers that um, are, are real. Um, but I, I think just staying diligent and keep, keep working, um, and we have the tenacity, if you make it through prison, you have the tenacity to make it out here in the corporate world. You know, the, the collateral consequences of having a criminal conviction make it so we have to work twice as, twice as hard. And then all the pejorative descriptions that society put on us make it so we have to work twice as hard. You know, I'm not an ex-felon, I'm a father. I'm not a criminal, I'm a son. I'm a justice-involved employee at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and I'm blessed to be in a position to where we're tackling some of the, the most 
pressing issues in society today, and one of them is, is how our nation deals with crime and punishment. That's really interesting, Ali. You know, what you said about hard work and that hard work and dedication, man, there, there is no substitute for that. I don't care if you're coming out of prison or you're out here trying to make it hard work. There's no substitute, not one. So, Nigel, uh, I know you've been coming in and out of San Quentin volunteering for many years. Yes. And, you know, what moved you to start volunteering in San Quentin? I mean, you could have been doing a million things, but, you know, you, you came to San Quentin to help us. I mean, what were some of the things that you learned there? What surprised you most about your interactions um, with the folks at San Quentin? Oh, man, so much surprised me. I just want to say that I got my start going into San Quentin through the Prison University Project. And I mentioned that because I think work is important, but so is higher education in prison. Like, you can't get to a good job if you don't also have the education. So I started there teaching a history of photography class. And what's so interesting about photography is that it's this really generous medium that allows you to start conversations with people. So that class was a history class, but it really was about showing photographs to the men there and talking to them about how these photographs could inspire them to tell their own stories. And when, when you can have an open conversation with somebody, when you can talk about their history, you create this bond that's, that's really meaningful. And I was inspired all the time. I mean, I hate to admit it, when I first went into prison, um, my mind was really full of like bad TV and movies and really shoddy journalism. So I had an expectation of what I was gonna see. And it was really anything but that. And I think one of the biggest surprises for me was to see the commonalities and the connections between life inside and life outside. And that people inside prison have a life. Right? It might not be the life that they want, but it is a life where people have family and work and jobs and friendship and hardships and struggles. And it's all happening in this place that's really about deprivation. But yet to, to, say, to bring up what Ali said, it's, I saw the tenacity of people in there. And I was like, whoa, these are the people I wanna work with because they, they thought like artists. And by that, I mean, people inside are incredible problem solvers. Um, because they have to be. There's so much that they're not given. And so I saw that and was really inspired to think, um, you know, I want to be a problem solver like that. And I want to figure out how to work in collaboration with people inside to solve the problems of incarceration and also post-incarceration. So I went in not knowing a lot and very quickly I was like, wow, this is an amazing place to be. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting that you bring up the resourcefulness of folks who are inside. Um, that's something that I was always struck by, just the entrepreneurial spirit of people who are in prison. I met so many folks, and Erlon, you're one of those people, man. You know, when I first met you down at Sentinella uh, State Prison back in like 2000, I think it was, um, you know, you struck me when I first met you, man. You struck me as somebody who was just a go-getter. And again, just like Ali, you were thinking beyond the walls, right? You and I, are both, we were both three strikes candidates. Right. We both had the, we were both sentenced under the three strikes law. And even from prison, you were trying to figure out how to reform the three strikes law from prison. And at the time, we couldn't even vote. But we're trying to put together an initiative where other people could. That's powerful. It says a lot about who you are. But I think that, um, you know, you've done an incredible job of, you know, helping to work to break down the stigma that's associated with incarceration um, through your podcast, Ear Hustle. Um, you know, for people watching today, um, can you share a little bit about, you know, the lessons that helped you remain positive while you were incarcerated and the things that, you know, that keep you inspired today? Uh, yeah, man, uh, I think mainly I, I never gave up, man. I, I always believed in myself, you know, and in believing in myself. Uh, unfortunately, I had a prior uh, prison term, right, that I served. So... Mm -hmm. I understood the complexities of prison when I came back, how easy it is to dig yourself in a hole, you know, how easy it is to find yourself in a hole. And one of the things that echoed in my head was something that my mother told me. Uh, it was when I went to Pelican Bay Shoe. It was like 1991. And she said, baby, uh, how you go to jail in jail, right? And that was something that was like deep, you know, it was like. <laughs> That's mom's wisdom. Hey. Yeah, it, was, it make you think, right? It's like, OK, so now I have to find something different. Like, you know, 
first I was involved in the gang. So when I got back into the, when I went back to prison, it was basically like just changing my whole trajectory, you know, being around like-minded people. Uh, you and I, we come from two different backgrounds, you know, um, and me personally, I was like, you know, I'm not gonna have no dealings with nothing that's going to stop me from communicating with individuals like I would my brother or family, you know what I'm saying? So I think it was me basically pre-programming my mind and to continue to believe in me. So when it came to like the struggle that we was all going through, we were all going through the three strikes law. I think everybody had three strikes and sure it was, it was like just looking impossible, you know? And it was like, I know we was talking in the past, like, you know, when we was hoping the law would change in 2014 and it didn't, it was like, a bomb had went off and we were all just zombies walking around, no hope, no nothing. But still, you, me, and a few other cats, we didn't give up, you know? We kept going to the law library because we kept believing that things are gonna change, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's what got me through was just like really, I never stopped believing in myself, man. And, and, and I held on to that and I held on to the fate that uh, if, if nobody gonna change it, I'm gonna change it. And I believed in that, so. I think that was one of the things that, that, that held me, man, was just me believing in myself that I can get it done. You know what, that, that is, that's really powerful. I know that that resiliency, you know, is something that we're all blessed with. And for some reason, I mean, we, we tend to forget it. You ever watch a baby learn how to walk? They fall down, bump their head, but no matter what, they always get up and they keep trying. And somehow as adults, you know, we get conditioned to forget about that resiliency until we're, you know, until we hit places like Pelican Bay and San Quentin. And um, I can definitely relate to the to the mom's wisdom that, uh, that you shared with us because I got a similar message from my mom, you know, um, when I was doing time. And it was, you know, if you want to get out of prison, you need to start acting like it. And that was just the bottom line for me. You know, I had to really start aligning my beliefs with my actions. And um, that's really what helped set me free. That a ton of support. Um, so I got a question for all y'all next. Um, you've each and every one of you have done incredible jobs of really working to help break down the stigmas. Ali, with your work at Chan Zuckerberg and all the organizations that you work with, um, you know, Erlon and Nigel with uh, Ear Hustle and really exposing the world to formerly incarcerated voices. Um, for the people that are listening today and watching today, um, can you share with them a little bit about what they can do out there to help make a difference when it comes to uh, criminal justice reform and prison reform? Ali, I'll start with you. Sure, um, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about this and there's a reason um, that all three of us were on the same prison yard and the reason that all three of us have been able to be successful post-incarceration, and that has to do with people who go into the prisons and volunteer and bring programs into the prisons. Um, it's super important, and I really don't believe that any of us would have had the opportunities post-incarceration if we didn't have those opportunities while we were incarcerated. Um, all, another thing people can do is stop all the pejorative language. You know, stop calling us ex-felons, ex-cons, all of that stuff. It doesn't do anything um, except for hurt. Um, I also, you know, if you, if you can't volunteer at a prison or jail, there are hundreds of nonprofits working to transform the criminal legal system all over the United States. Um, these nonprofits, um, they, they, a lot of them run on very, 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 very nimble budgets, very small budgets. So, you know, donate. Um, these are the type of things that you can do to really, really, you know, make community safer and, and enhance second chances for people coming home. And if you're an employer, hire someone. I guarantee someone who's formerly incarcerated is going to be the best employee you have. Mm. Nigel, your thoughts? Yeah, I have three things that I deeply believe in. One is the idea of proximity, is that you can make change by touching things and being mm -hmm. close. So for me, starting as a volunteer in San Quentin was so important. Um, you can't understand something if you're not in it, if you don't go in and mm -hmm. listen and spend time there. You can't go in thinking you know how to solve the problem. You have to go in humbly and make connections, make relationships and learn, and then figure out what you can do. I've also learned through experience that what's really important are more inside and outside professional 
collaborations. So yes, it's good to go in as a volunteer, but it's also good to go in as a colleague and look for people that you can help and work with as an equal. Um, we've really done that with Ear Hustle and um, it's been quite successful. And then the third thing is expect excellence. So there is so much talent inside. If you go into prison and you want to work with programs or you want to bring professional responsibility and jobs in there, expect that you're going to find people who can step up to what you need to, what you need to have done, and you will find those people. Um, again, there's so many creative and talented people inside, and unfortunately, society seems to forget that. And that is one of the most detr detrimental things that can happen to a person to be underestimated. And if we stop underestimating people, I think that goes a long way to um, you know, trying to solve a problem. Have faith and um, expect people can do, can do really well. Erla? So I would say um, individuals have to continue to invest in the individuals that's inside of, uh, of prisons because you yourself, Kenyatta, Ali, uh, myself included, we all had jobs before we even got out of prison because of the investment that uh, some organizations had within the prisons. So uh, I would definitely say the community need to continue to invest in the prisons. And I say that because uh, individuals want to do better, right? And individuals are doing better, but in certain circumstances, individuals don't have the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? So I would say for people like volunteers, continue to volunteer, continue to uh, support individuals inside. And I sit here today based on Nigel volunteering, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to say that because we were able to come together and create a podcast that wasn't just a little podcast. It became in the top one percent. And uh, what I didn't know and what I didn't understand is that we had a hand in lifting that veil so people can look inside. You know, us allowing individuals to tell their own stories, that was that was big, you know? Um, so I would say continue to invest in the uh, people that's in prison because that's what's gonna make uh, society safer. Yeah, that is that is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. I feel like, you know, each of, each of us as individuals, um, we're always looking outside of ourselves uh, for the answers of what we can do about issues like this. But, you know, I would encourage folks to really take a look at yourself, you know, examine your own biases, examine your own uh, prejudices that you might have. And um, really, you know, just try to have some empathy for other folks. I mean, right now we're living in some very, very trying times. And I think that we could all use just a little bit more empathy in the way that we go about our business every day. But um, so Erlon Nigel, uh, do you guys have any suggestions for folks and steps that they could take, initial steps that they could take to get proximate, more proximate to the issues? Definitely. I mean, I think the first thing is to look at what you do in your life. What are the things that you can bring into a system that will be helpful? I'm an educator. And so I found the Prison University Project. That's why I started going in as a teacher. And inside San Quentin, there's so many opportunities for volunteering. Um, so I, I would say first, look at what you can bring in go in with those skills and share them. And then once you're in there, start looking around and seeing where you can help in other ways. So, I mean, from my experience, I went from teaching to going to the media lab and starting a podcast, but it all started because I wanted to volunteer and find a way to go in there. And for me, it was teaching, but there's endless opportunities. And most prisons have a community outreach um, department that you can contact and find out what are the different programs that are in there. And if there aren't one, Get the tenacity and go in there and start your own. That's what I say. Mm. <laughs> love it. Love it. I mean, you guys did it uh, with, with Ear Hustle. You know, Chris Redlitz and Beverly Parenti did the same thing with The Last Mile, a program that Ali and I both uh, benefited greatly from. And so, um, Erlon, your thoughts on this? I'm going to say this, man. Um, when we started Ear Hustle, people were wondering, like, or asking, like, man, people, why would people want to know what's going on in prisons? Well, people are taxpayers. They pay for prisons. They should know exactly what goes on in prison. And that's how you can basically change the culture in prison if um, the community continue to be invested in it. So definitely, man. Yeah, I think that community proximity to prisons would be eye-opening for a lot of people. I think they'd be shocked to see a lot of the conditions and the things that are going on inside of prison. Um, prayers out to all the folks that are inside really dealing with 
COVID and everything else that's happening inside the system right now. So I can recall uh, thinking about when I came home, you know, the things that I hoped for, you know, I think equally as much as I hoped to go home, I hoped for, you know, an opportunity to redeem myself. Um, and much of my understanding or idea of redemption at the time really revolved around work. And I was just really curious, Erlon and not, uh, excuse me, Erlon and Ali, for you guys, you know, what were the things that you hoped for, you know, when you came home? Ali, I'll start with you. Uh, I mean, I, I touched on this earlier. I really wanted to be self-sufficient and I wanted to redeem myself with my family, my friends, and my community. And a big part of being of self-sufficiency is being gainfully employed and having that stability where I could reach out and have the time and resources to start repairing some of the things that were shattered because of my incarceration, specifically relationships. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Erlon, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, it, it takes me back to when, when you and I, Kenyatta, back in like the early 2000s, we was in uh, Sentinella State Prison, and I didn't want to be a failure when I got out. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to go through the same thing I went through the first time I got out because I didn't apply myself. So this time around, it was more like, okay, the things that I want to do is be able to change the way people look at this three strike law and get rid of it. Because to me, it was pretty much an oppressive law, you know? So uh, I'm continuing to do that today. You know, I'm out here campaigning, uh, hopefully in 2022, we can repeal this law. So I think one of my thoughts of when, getting, when I was gonna get out was to continue to work, which I am, and continue to strive. And, and, and I think, I believe personally, like being a part of the Ear Hustle movement, a lot of people, they don't look at me as Oh, uh, ex-offender, ex-felon, ex-whatever. I think they look at me as a personality that's uh, helping individuals understand what it's like in the criminal justice system and, and basically what goes on within. So I'm continuing to do that work. Well, you know what? You've done very well for yourself. Both of you guys have. And I think that we can learn a lot from your lived experience. Well, folks, I mean, I could talk about this all day long with y'all, but we've uh, come to a close today. I want to thank you guys for, for taking the time to share your stories with us and to really help, you know, provide some information for folks that really want it and need it. You know, we're in some trying times right now, and I think that these trying times really present a great opportunity for us to make some systemic change uh, that I think we all want to see. So thank you guys for joining us today. So we all have a role to play in justice reform. And I'd like to just take a moment to thank the leadership with our partner companies at Slack, Zoom, and Dropbox for really creating the space for us to let Next Chapter thrive within these companies. Um, you know, our program is more than just an apprenticeship program. We're really all about coming in and creating an equitable place for everyone to thrive. And I just want to thank everybody that's been involved from the beginning for helping us. Um, I'd like to thank our partners with uh, the Kellogg Foundation uh, Chan Zuckerberg, and also a Midiar Network. Um, I'd like to thank our guests from Ear Hustle, Erlon and Nigel, their whole team. Um, this is a huge challenge that we face, but it's also a huge opportunity for us. Right now is the time. We've seen that uh, this kind of support in a program like Next Chapter works. We have three people that are thriving at Slack right now, and we have eight more people who are in our current cohort who we really are excited about their futures as well. And so, we look forward to our next update at Next Frontiers, hopefully. And with that, I'll pass it off to Julie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kenyatta. That was incredibly powerful. There's one theme that cuts across this year's frontiers. It's how to think differently, how to reimagine the way we work as a society to make the most of our potential as individuals and employees, as businesses and teams, and as a society as a whole. And while our next speaker has a somewhat different approach to illuminating social issues, using her humor to highlight patterns and share insights about the ways we work and interact together, the issues she cares about are exactly the kinds of issues we're all focused on today. How to make strength out of diversity, to build teams that succeed because they are inclusive, to avoid performative work and find better ways to do the real work 
to work better together. You may know her from TikTok. You may know her from Twitter. But long before there was either one, she was a UX designer at Yahoo and then at Google. And by the way, at Yahoo, she worked on the original photo sharing tool Flickr, founded by none other than Slack's own Stuart Butterfield and Cal Henderson. So I am very excited to hear some stories about that. Please welcome Sarah Cooper to Frontiers. Hey, everybody. I'm Sarah Cooper. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. Thank you so much, Slack, for having me. Um, a lot of you may know this, but some of you might not. Uh, I used to work with Stuart Butterfield at Flickr um, back in 2007 when I was a designer there. And uh, the thing I remember about Stuart was that he would send emails in the middle of the night. I'm talking like 3 a.m. Um, and they were pretty long and pretty detailed. And I don't know what he was doing. I don't know when he slept, but I would get into work at around eight or nine or 10. And I'd have an email from Stuart um, and I would not be sure what to do with it. Um, but I do know that I remembered that little detail about him and I kind of tucked it away in the back of my head and I turned it into one of my tricks to appear smart in email, which is basically to schedule emails to send in the middle of the night so that everyone thinks that you're constantly thinking about the product um, and also have no life outside of the company. So uh, thank you, Stuart, for that trick. Um, obviously, I think that he really was thinking about the product, but I think I know now why it makes sense that he went on to form a company uh, where you create a product that is an always-on communication tool that no one can ever escape. It was because he was really, really interested in having people respond to his middle-of-the-night emails. Um, and that's kind of how I come up with almost all of my content is basically through observation. Um, I remember when I wrote 10 Tricks to Appear Smart in Meetings, I was still working at Google at the time, and I was scared to put it out there because I didn't want my coworkers to think that I was making fun of them uh, because I was making fun of them. Uh, and then I remember a few weeks after that article came out, I was in a meeting, uh, about 14 people were in the meeting, and there was a VP who was pacing around the room, which is one of the tricks, you just get up and you start pacing. And then he asked the presenter to go back one slide, which is another one of the tricks. And he did both of those at the same time. And then he looked over at me and he winked. And I remember thinking, you know, that's how you become a VP at Google. You do multiple meeting tricks at the same time. Um, I did work at Google for almost four years. And some of you, I think, probably worked there before. And some of you might work there in the future. Who knows? Um, it was a lot of fun working there, uh, you know, back when we were all in the office together. Uh, there was free food, there was nap pods, there was games, um, there was Kool-Aid, there was lots of Kool-Aid. You had to drink the Kool-Aid. That was kind of one of the things you had to do. Um, and who says cults aren't fun, you know? Um, but it, it was a lot of fun. There was uh, fun names for everybody, like the older Googlers were called Greglers, and the new Googlers were called Newglers. Um, they had some trouble, though, coming up with a name for the black Googlers, and finally they decided to just call them David and Sean. Uh, they figured that was easier. Um, they had really great holiday parties, too. This was back when people spent a lot of money on holiday parties. Um, I would go into a Google holiday party, and it would just be a DJ, a Christmas tree, and a table full of blow. And now everything is so PC, you know, you can't have the Christmas tree anymore. So it's kind of sad. Um, I did meet my husband at Google, and I'm sure some of you are also committing HR violations. Uh, you better watch out for those. Um, a lot of people say that if you marry someone who works 10 feet away from you, that's like settling. But I think it's more like giving up. You know, it's like you're here, I'm here, I can see your calendar. You know, this feels convenient. You know, um, I, uh, I also thought it was just great to be married to someone who's like a real software engineer and not like a software engineer like Twitter or something. Um, but it is difficult sometimes because he has weird ways of solving problems. Like um, anytime there's an issue in our relationship, he makes me file a bug. Um, so one time I felt like we weren't spending enough time together. So he... Um, asked me to file a bug, and then he marked it working as intended. 
And then another time I thought that he wasn't listening to me, so I filed a bug for that and he reassigned it to my therapist. Uh, so yeah, maybe don't, don't marry a software engineer. Um, I, I ended up leaving Google um, after reading one of those articles that said you should quit your job and follow your dreams. So I quit my job and then I realized those articles are written by people who want your job. And I spent a few years writing articles like that, hoping someone would quit their job so that I could take their job. Um, but after five, six, seven years, um, I, I actually have sort of made it. And uh, last week just finished uh, filming my very first Netflix special. Um, but it's kind of weird how uh, as, as much as I've tried to get out of tech and into entertainment, it seems like tech just keeps following me everywhere I go. Because even with Netflix, I remember when it was just a tech startup and now it's this huge Hollywood company. Um, and uh, yeah, now I'm here speaking to you guys to Slack. And I actually never used Slack um, before um, until last year when I worked on my first pilot and everybody was on Slack. And uh, I, would, I would get those middle of the night notifications uh, just like I used to get with Stuart. So it's kind of like you can never really escape it. Um, so I'm excited to see what kind of uh, Hollywood creations Slack comes up with. And I'm also very excited to talk to you guys today about um, what it's like working um, in the world today and uh, the future of, of working and, 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 and entertainment. So thank you so much for having me and I'm excited to chat with you. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. That was great. Um, and let me tell you, the do not disturb function in Slack is very, very key for Stuart's 3 a.m. messages. Um, it's definitely helped me. We think it's safe to say that just about everyone is navigating some pretty extreme ups and downs this year. So we'll go out on a limb and include you in that group. You've been so prolific. How do you manage to keep your creative juices flowing during this crazy time? Well, I, I think that being bored there's a lot to be said for being bored. Um, and uh, I think that necessity and just ha not really having any other options <laughs> was um, turned out to be actually a good thing. Um, before the pandemic hit, I was going to open mics. I was hosting open mics. I was um, working on my next book. Um, and I'd probably still be doing all of those things right now. And I probably wouldn't be talking to you if the pandemic hadn't hit. But because of quarantine, and lockdown, I was sort of in my living room every day and just kind of forced to try things. And um, I think that that is, is really the only reason that I was able to um, find the success that I found. It was because I, I just didn't have anything else to do. And I've always thought about that. At, at Google, we would have you know, brainstorming sessions. I'm sure you guys have brainstorming sessions too where you, you, know, you go into a conference room and you put sticky notes up on the board and you try to come up with ideas. And sometimes the best ideas come when you're not even trying to come up with anything. And I think that it was just a lot of just sitting around and just being bored and then just kind of playing um, that kind of led to uh, the, the TikToks that I made. And so um, for me, being creative just kind of happens when I'm trying to do other things or, or not trying to do anything at all. You wrote a delightful book called A Hundred Tricks to Appear Smart in Meetings. Now that many people are working remotely, will there be a sequel about Zoom meetings? And on a more serious note, how can we make meetings work better for everyone, uh, including introverts? Yeah, meetings are the worst. Um, <laughs> and Zoom meetings are even tougher, I think, because we're forced to look at ourselves and so I think there's a lot more um, performative listening going on where people are like, you know, really nodding and really pretending to really be engaged because um, they can kind of see themselves. And so they're kind of directing themselves, too. Um, and so I feel like it's it's even harder to hide on Zoom than it is um, in real life. And uh, I'm, I don't know if I could write an entire book about it, but um, I, I think that some of the tricks that I, I write about in my book uh, will still work on Zoom. Like translating percentages into fractions will always make you look like you know math. So you can always do that even on a Zoom call. Um, I think for meetings to be, you know, better for introverts, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of like a, a lazy extrovert, I would say. Like I like people, but I also like sleeping. So it's just, uh, I've always uh, been kind of, 
you know, let other people talk. I was sort of known as a consensus builder, which is basically when you repeat what someone says over here and then you repeat what someone said over here and then you kind of say, oh, how can we combine these two ideas? That's kind of what consensus building is. Um, it's, you can try it, it totally works. It makes you look like you're a, a leader. So definitely give that a shot. Um, but I think that, you know, letting, letting, making sure there's a forum for people to share ideas when they're not naturally um, inclined to share their ideas um, is, is probably the best way to get introverts involved because I think introverts probably sometimes have really good ideas and they, they just don't, you know, have the, you know, they're not, just not as open or as uh, forthright with them as, as extroverts are. And, um, you know, I did find that a lot of times the person who was the quietest person in the room maybe had the best ideas or had the smartest things to say. Um, and so when that person speaks, definitely repeat what they just said, because that'll make you look smart as well. You've also written some great pieces about how to pair smart in emails. Uh, what are your tips for improving written communication? Um, well, I've gone back and forth on this because I'm a person that really hates exclamation points, but yet I can't get away from them. And there's really just no way to show enthusiasm in an email. And, um, and so I, I think that you need to use some exclamation points here and there. But I also think that we can be more direct in our email communication. Um, you know, if you have to say no, just say no. A lot of times we spend a paragraph saying no instead of just saying no. And it, it's kind of, you know, a bit of a time waster. So I think on email, um, it's, it's good to just be as direct as possible, which is, is difficult, is more difficult for women because sometimes if we're too short, then we're seen as having an attitude or something. So um, hopefully that'll change. Yeah, no idea what you're talking about there. <laughs> um, on a similar note, what do you think are some of the most overused phrases that people say in the workplace that when you stop and think about it, don't really mean a whole lot. Um, for example, let me circle back to that or you know, the dreaded, let's take a step back. Um, what are the phrases you wish would go away and are there any that you wish we'd say more frequently? Well, I think the interesting thing about a lot of these phrases is that they do mean something, they just don't mean what you said. Like let's circle back on that usually means I don't wanna talk about that right now or that's not a very good idea. You know, um, so <laughs> the funny thing about the corporate world is that we have all of these sort of passive aggressive ways of communicating with each other. And a lot of them are like embedded in these phrases um, that new ones keep getting invented all the time. Um, one of the best things about WeWork is that I get to overhear people's conversations. And yesterday um, somebody was on a call and said that they really wanted to own the insight cultivation process insight cultivation process. So I feel like we just constantly invent these sort of terms that sound smart and kind of make us sound like we're being really polite with each other. And um, I kind of wish, and I, I think it, it, it does help to just say what you mean and just kind of get away from a lot of those phrases and all of the jargon. Your books and articles are filled with some pretty hilarious flowcharts and diagrams about workplace bureaucracy that feel a little too real. What do you think managers and team leaders can do to encourage more creativity on the job? I think, I think it's, a lot of it is just having to do with freedom. Um, and, you know, it's kind of how Stuart came up with uh, Slack. You know, I, I, I believe he was working on another product, which was a game, and then he noticed how people were communicating inefficiently. And that's kind of how I came up even with 10 Tricks to Appear Smart Meetings. I would be sitting in these meetings and I would just kind of let my mind wander and I would pay attention to what, what my mind was wandering to and those things were those observations about what people were doing in meetings. And so um, I think that, you know, instead of like, be creative, be creative, it's more about, you know, having the freedom to explore and see where your mind is going and see what, what you're passionate about. See what you do when no one's telling you what to do, but you just do naturally and, and give um, employees a way to kind of discover those things on their own. And when they do discover those things, give them a way to actually turn those ideas into products that the, the company might be able to actually build and, and release. Before the start of 2020, the way people worked was already changing as Workplace adapted to new cloud-based apps and tools. Now that the pandemic has forced many of us to work remotely, we've become even more reliant on technology to do our jobs. In this brave new digital first world, how do we stay human and real with one another? This one's a really, it's a really tough one. Um, I especially worry about 
kids just having to sit at home and stare at their friends in boxes. I mean, it's just, it's, it's very um, impersonal. And um, there's a lot that I feel like we're losing by not being able to be with each other in person. Um, even right now, I'm just staring down the barrel of, of a camera. Um, and, you know, if this was a year ago, I'd be in a room and it'd be full of people and we'd all sort of be able to kind of react and, and um, you know, build off of each other's excitement and um, energy. And we just, we don't really have that. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I'm not sure uh, what the answer to that is. Um, I think that probably making sure to have smaller meetings is still going to be important. Um, I was, you know, I was in a Zoom call with uh, 80 people and it's just completely unmanageable. You can't, there's, uh, nobody wants to talk and then somebody does want to talk and then 10 people want to talk. I mean, it's just very unmanageable. So I think getting really comfortable with this new environment with a smaller groups will probably help um, us a lot keep those, keep those connections. But I think also just, um, saying what's going on. Um, a lot of times we try to like go through the motions and just be like, oh, this is normal. This is all fine. Everything's good. But just kind of calling it out and saying, this is strange. This is weird. It's, it's weird that we can't be together. I think that that kind of helps break the ice a little bit. Everyone can be on the same page about how this is a little bit strange and, and maybe go from there. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. And I think the nice thing about working from home is it's hard to pretend it's normal when your dog is barking and your kid is sitting on your lap. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, you made a satirical video about what it means to be a thought leader um, that feels just as relevant today. Uh, what do you think are the qualities of a true leader? And which traits and qualities do you think more people should aspire to cultivate in the workplace? Um, I think a true leader really is very good at listening and um, doesn't try to impose uh, their thoughts or ideas on people, but really actually listens to what people are saying and plays along, you know, like one of the best things about improv and learning improv is the whole idea of yes and, which basically means when someone shares an idea, you don't say no, but you say yes and, and you kind of try to follow uh, the, the, where that idea can take you. And you're open to that. And so I think that that listening and that open-mindedness um, and, and also being able to create a forum where people are listening and people are being open-minded. I think that's kind of the best quality of, of a leader. Um, I, you know, I make, I make fun of the whole like pacing around the room, but really that, that was one of the best leaders at Google that, that, uh, trick is based on him. And I think that's just how he listened as he would pace around the room. I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, he looks so smart pacing around the room, but he was actually just, um, listening. And then when he spoke, you could tell that he actually heard what everyone was saying. And so I think that's probably the most important quality of a leader. I wonder if that leader still paces on Zoom and if it's distracting he does. that he keeps going <laughs> in and out of the frame. Um, I love your hilarious yet um, all too familiar takes on gender politics in the workplace, uh, including how to be successful without hurting men's feelings. Definitely something every woman needs to read. Um, do you think gender equality in the workplace is getting better or worse or is it about the same? Um, I think it's getting a lot better. Um, and and then the next day happens and I think it's getting worse. So I think it's both getting better and worse at the same time. Um, I think one thing that's getting really a lot better and more clear to women is that we need each other and we need to be supportive of each other. And those communities that you're forming between other women in the, in the workplace are genuinely very, very helpful. Um, and so, and then I think it's also, you know, I was really, um, heartened by the number of men who reached out to me when my book came out and said how, awesome it was to kind of get insight into what it was like to be a woman in the workplace. I thought I was going to get a bunch of hate mail, but instead I got a lot of men saying that they appreciated the book. And so I thought that was great. Um, and so I think just recognizing, being able to recognize that it is a different experience for a woman, especially a woman in a male dominated industry. Um, I think that that is going a long way toward um, gender equality. And I'm so excited to say that, you know, my Netflix special, my director was a woman, my director of photography was a woman, um, the whole, you know, almost everyone on the producing team was um, female. And so it was just like, it, I think it is getting better in so many ways. And so it's, it's great to see that, that representation. 
There's a lot of talk about diversity in the workplace and unfortunately a lot of lip service about it. What are some concrete actions organizations can take to foster inclusive workplaces that reflect the true diversity of their communities? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're asking me a lot of really tough questions. Um, <laughs> I, the, I have absolutely no idea. I really, I, 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 I think that creating a forum for people to, to talk about, you know, what they're experiencing is really important. Um, and uh, it, it really starts at the top and, you know, being able to see uh, a leader, a CEO, a founder who cares about these things, who genuinely cares about these things and doesn't just um, talk about them to the press, but actually walks it and talks this caring about, uh, you know, gender equality and racial equality and diversity. Um, I think that that goes a long way. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of lip service is basically what my books are about. And I, I think that you know, you have to always find new ways to show that you care and to show that it's important because the second you do something that's exactly what another company is doing, it automatically looks like you're just kind of copying them in order to uh, make it look like you care when you don't care. And so I think that changing it and finding new ways and then making sure that what you're doing is really like what's in your heart as a leader um, will kind of trickle down, hopefully, to the rest of the company and um, if it's important to you as the, the leader of the company, then hopefully it'll be important to everyone else. That's great. Well, I know I've asked you a lot of tough questions. I hope this one's a little bit easier. Um, remote work is all the rage, so on trend. Um, if you had to choose from work from anywhere, where would it be and why? Um, it would be in Malibu, I think because I love looking at the ocean. I don't actually like going to the beach, but I love looking at the water. And so being able to work while looking at the water, I think is, is something that I would love to do. But my, my second favorite place is definitely WeWork. <laughs> That's great. Um, finally, when people interview you about the state of modern work, um, what question do you wish more people would ask you? Um, what question do I wish more people would ask me? Um, I guess I wish more people would ask me how they can give me money. Um, yeah. That's, that's a great, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate you being here and congratulations on all your success. We can't wait for the Netflix special. Thank you for being part of Slack Frontiers. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us for day one of Slack Frontiers. If you missed any of the sessions today, they will be available for playback on demand tomorrow. And speaking of tomorrow, we can't wait to see you again tomorrow. We have so many more great sessions to go, plus a keynote featuring customers from Lyft and ASU, and even more chances to get your questions answered and learn even more. Thank you so much for being part of Slack Frontiers, and we'll see you tomorrow. Individual people are getting more productive. The software tools are getting better and better. With that comes a lot of increase in individual productivity. In a lot of organizations, you end up in a situation where different people are pushing literally in different directions. And the net effect of that is just a zero. On the other hand, everyone moving together causes a lot more actual productivity at the organizational level. I think the future of work is starting to think a lot more about organizational performance and how to align people.